Welcome back again. Uh, you know, I was just thinking to myself that um, uh, what we're doing here is historically it's been called something like shop talk. We're, we're talking shop. We're talking about what we do in the studio and things like that. And so uh, it's, it's a pleasure for anybody who's in the business to actually talk about the stuff they do. So I hope you can get something out of it as well. But it is, uh, you know, typically in the shop talk mindset, you're looking at, you know, maybe axiomatic expressions or things like that, you know. Like, like find out what your darkest dark and your lightest light are, um, you know, those kinds of things. Um, but uh, I'm doing it a little more prosaically, but I think if you pay attention, you'll hear some of those, uh, some of those lines in what I'm saying. Uh, the word one student used to say, uh, or one, at one point said to me, you, speak, you teach in riddles. And uh, yeah, until you know actually what these phrases mean, they are riddles. So I guess there's a reason why you have to be a tiny bit more prosaic. But uh, so often you can't even bring it across to a student without nature in front of them, the picture they're working on in front of them, and then looking at it side by side with that student and saying, don't you see, this is that application. So it's not possible to do that or much in this format. So I'm trying to do it with pure verbal and um, hopefully it'll be a little bit helpful. This is a question that, or in fact, there's two questions today that sort of come uh, as a set. And this is from uh, David. Um, I, should, I better say David B. Okay, I'll maybe put it down that way so we have that. Doesn't here to the two questions? Doesn't the impressionist do more than copy nature? And the second question is: Shouldn't the painter select and modify nature in the interest of beauty? Boy, those are loaded. I mean, so loaded for bare kinds of questions. <laughs> I, you know, most of my conversations with students. So in a, the last thing I would be telling a student is to stand in front of nature and change it to make it better. I mean, what has their brain even got in terms of what better means? What is better? You know what I mean? So most students haven't spent 10 and 20 years before uh, nature or, or the great artists, you know, at, at least at the museums or other places where you can see them. So. What is your better based on, you know? So your idea of improving, it always, it always baffles me when a student will, you know, when I take a, a body of people out to paint landscape, they will set up something and they'll say, what should I change? And I, and I will say, well, why did you pick this spot if you're going to change something already? <laughs> so, you know, and they have to have a good answer for that. There can be a good answer for that. But, you know, if you do your job, you'll sit down with a good spot and you'll paint it the way it looks. And um, yeah, will there be variations? I mean, that's the last of your concerns. The problem you really have as an impressionist is to search out the music in the truth in front of you. I love that Velasquez quote, the quote from the book on Velasquez by R.E.M. Stevenson, where he says, describing this kind of working, basically the impressionist the guy painting from nature in front of him, he's, he talks about how they will search out the truth until poetry shows up. Now, that's way different from thinking you have some brilliant idea about changing nature. You know, what's it going to fit, you know, except some plan you've got based in your head. And if you keep doing that, you're going to keep winding up with your pictures all looking the same. But your job is to search out, find out where the beauty lies. Sit there before nature with all humility and start studying the relationships of the colors, the values, the effects. Study the effects in their order and begin to understand clearly what the visual order is of a painting so you can actually see if there's something wrong with it that you could actually improve. But your biggest job as a student, though, is simply to sit there. In fact, learning to see, according to uh, Gamble's own uh, writing, is learning to see the relationships of things. So you have your hands so full <laughs> you know, uh, already. So, but let's address the question as if you're a professional and, um, uh, and ask whether the same thing applies. And I already alluded to the idea that a professional like a, like a, a de Camp or a Tarbell, they would say things like, uh, Tarbell, I think Tarbell said, uh, someday I want to really, really get it and get the, get the likeness, you know, someday. <laughs> so... He was sitting there with that as his modus operandi. He wasn't trying to manipulate the likeness. He was trying to get the likeness. Now, when you set up something and it's beautiful and you do a good job of it, Gamble used to like to say to you, uh, look, your picture's only going to be as beautiful 
That's what you set up. If you don't set up something beautiful, your painting isn't going to be beautiful. Well, that mindset tells you that he isn't in the, th in the world to say, let us set up some junk and then we'll do some manipulation to it and somehow make beauty out of it. I don't think, I don't think many people think that way. However, yeah, obviously in the world of the imaginative painter, uh, there is that necessity. You start with absolutely nothing, right? So you will, you're always messing around and manipulating your stuff, trying to figure out why that isn't working. But when you're impressionist, when you're painting from life, and that's what this person is talking about, why would you do that, right? Do you consider yourself having, you know, so fully invested that you actually, you know, and there was such a master of beauty that you actually know that you, you know, I'm going to change this, I'm going to change that, I'm going to change this, I'm going to change that. Well, you certainly, even if you did, you wouldn't be doing it very early in a picture. There was a statement Gamble made to uh, one of my fellow students. Uh, there was a glaring light coming between two panels um, of a, uh, a screen that was behind the still life. And that person wanted to deaden that light effect. That student did. And uh, what Gamble said to him is, paint it the way it is. Paint it just straight and true. We'll figure out later whether or not it's bad for the composition. Well, I like to have the students figure it out now whether it's good for the composition and not and change it on the spot and don't work with it that way. But I think what I would have perceived is that what was beautiful about that effect, plus this, you know, this, the pile of junk plus that effect, was that was the beauty. It was a visual beauty. And uh, that light coming through there was, a part, was part and parcel with the unity of the whole thing, especially when you're describing how light works and that sort of thing, which students don't understand. Most students do want to manipulate and make a pretty picture. And I, <laughs> pretty is an interesting one. I'm going to come back to pretty in a second. I wanted to finish, there was a second quote. I said, Tarbell said that, you know, he just really wanted to make one someday, really, truly like. And, but, but uh, DeCamp also says, paint straight and true like a Christian. You know, uh, what does he mean? Does he mean don't manipulate? Yeah, I think so. I mean, falseness in a picture is embarrassing. And I, what I find, certainly found in my student years, is that every time I did something to make it sort of nicer in some way was nothing. I mean, it improved nothing because the falseness of whatever I did because of the lack of visual data made it just like a screwy idea, you know? So, you know, but... Nevertheless, I mean, all you landscape painters will tell me that you decided to move a tree over a little bit and that sort of thing, and have a nice day. I definitely don't want to recommend that to students, though. I really do want to say, find a good spot where it's basically right, and we'll, and put it down with as much truth as you can, and search out the beauty in front of you, and let's see what you got, and have that conversation way later. But the question of this manipulation of nature is a question of whether or not you already have an agenda about what beauty is. And... Uh, I think that's the biggest worry because beauty is is all over the place in nature and it's the most wonderful feast. Um, I, what was that famous movable feast thing of Hemingway? Uh, but what is that? You know, except that nature is always doing something just a little different. One one image you look at, one 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 phenomenon you're looking at, one scene is stunningly beautiful in light. Another one in the color is just singing, and another one it's about form and. Another one about line, and it's central, you know, this dominating beauties. So, which agenda do you want to have, you know? So, uh, the proper, you know, I say proper, it's a funny word, but I suggest the most important um, uh, way to think is with all humility. You're standing before something beautiful beyond belief, and you're sitting... Now, you're, it's true, your job is to find it into a frame. So, you do have a, so we say, a compositional job with that. But the, dump, you know, the, the major problem you're going to have with that is just get your center of interest in the right place. And then we'll see, right? But if you haven't mastered the center of interest, you haven't got the elements that make that up, and if you haven't got the distribution of the, and, and all the other things of the colors and the effects around there, you can't much make that decision. And you start painting out of your head and out of a book. And that's, I, I would suggest that I, that's where I found the problems actually lie. Uh, so, but yeah, back to that question of pretty versus beauty. Uh, I have a feeling that, and what I see in a lot of pictures is a predictable kind of, oh, that's a so-and-so, you'd say. That's a so-and-so because th this person characteristically finds that kind of thing, you know, and it makes that kind of thing that kind of way. That's their way of pretty, you know, that's their way of, that's their way of beauty. Uh, as I said, an impressionist wants to keep an open book. He wants to be ready for you know, form beauty one day and, and um, 
and busy beauty the next day, you know, the distribution of busyness or textural beauty or whatever else you want to talk about in, in, their, in, the, in the play of those kinds of things. So, uh, and uh, so if I haven't answered that question fully and completely, be sure to come back to me with your comments, um, you know, um, and also appreciate if you do put a like or a, a subscribe onto these things as I go by. Thank you very much. I'll see you in the next one.